The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome to this recorded service for June the 7th. We're glad that you're with us to worship. Next Sunday, we're going to try virtual communion. It's taken me weeks to decide it's a good idea, so we'll see how that works. You will need to get yourself some bread and grape juice or wine and have that available during the service. And then in two weeks, we will continue these recorded services, but we will have a live outdoor service on the north end of the lot at 9.30 in the morning. And so we look forward to seeing some of you there. Let's worship God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Our Lord is a great God who says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. Praise the Lord. confess our sins. God, God of grace, love, and communion, 
We confess that we have failed to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We ignore your commandments, stray from your way, and follow other gods. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Raise us to new life so that we may serve you faithfully in justice and in love. Amen. In the death of Jesus on the cross, the Father forgives our sin and sends the Spirit to live with us and in us. Believe the good news. Amen.
sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. Died on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to Our scripture reading this morning is Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the water from the water. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. And God called the dome sky, and there was evening and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and God called the waters that were gathered together seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. 
The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. And God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with its seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that everything that he had made and indeed, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from the work that he had done in creation. And these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. God. Well, this long passage is one that you're familiar with, I suppose. It was in the lectionary because today is Trinity Sunday, the Sunday after Pentecost. And it's named Trinity Sunday because on this day, preachers try to explain what cannot be explained without many, many pages. So we look at this passage. We see the Trinity in the beginning when God, the Father, created the heavens and the earth, God the Spirit and God the Son were both present. The spirit brooded over the face of the waters 
And the Son, the Word, the Logos of God, was there when God spoke. So the Father spoke, the Son acted, and the Spirit was present watching it all. And that is the presence of Trinity that we find in the first few verses of our Bible. Now God, understood as the triune God and not just the Father, God goes on to create the world in six days. And he creates everything and at the end he creates human beings. Male and female, he created them. So we are created in these two kinds. We're created to live with and for one another, just as the Trinity exists with and for one another in a never-ending dance of love. But what does it say? What does it not say? It does not say that God created them white and black. And it does not say that God created the white man and then the others came along some other way. And despite the tortured exegesis of our forefathers before and after the Civil War, the scriptures nowhere divide people into racial groups. Now there's a lot of the Jews versus their neighbors in the Old Testament. And those divisions are ultimately absorbed by and overcome in the life and death of Jesus. And Paul makes it clear to Jews and Gentiles that in Christ there's no difference. We're all one people. We're all reconciled by Jesus' death and resurrection. So how is it, if we're all one in Christ, that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America? How is it that we are so separated in our mission and our ministry? I don't know the answers to those questions, but they reflect a truth. We are not united. Now, back in the 90s in Martinsville, Virginia, the church that I served and Grace Presbyterian Church, an African-American congregation on the other side of town, decided to work on these issues. And we had some meetings at which we sat and talked with each other about race. So one, one meeting, we, one night we went to their building and they began to vent, basically. They told stories after stories of how it used to be in this very segregated town. And then they began to tell stories of how it still was. There's one large grocery store chain headquartered in Charlotte that had a policy that if you wrote them a check, they wanted to see your driver's license. That makes sense, right? We learned that if you were African American and you wrote them a check, they scrutinized your license very carefully, and then they wrote black on the front of your check in big letters. That's just the way it had always been. Well, they didn't do anything like that to white people. So one of our men, a retired furniture company executive who didn't put up with this kind of thing, went to the store the next day, wrote them a check. They cheerfully accepted it. He did not ask to see his license. And he said, are you gonna write white on that check? And they said, no, why would we do that? He said, I know you write black on the checks of African Americans so I thought you would write white on mine. Then he explained to the cashier and the manager and anybody else who was listening that if they didn't stop this racial profiling of people immediately, he would personally see to it that all the members of our church and as many other white people as he could find would stop shopping there forever. 
and they stopped. It was a small blow for justice. It didn't affect the dynamics of the town, which were terrible, but it was a start. You see, our black friends and us, we live in different worlds. We live in a world where you can go jogging or bike riding or bird watching or just be outside and there are no worries. They live in a world in which the police can and will stop them, berate them, question them, and perhaps kill them only because of their race. And that might not happen in Newton, but in many places it's true. I don't know if it's true here. I don't know because I don't know that many black people in this town. I don't know the black pastors in this town. No one I know knows them. I can't find them. One time I was in a class. We had a guest lecture from an African-American man who was I think dean of a seminary in Charlotte. And he said that in America, the white church gathers on Sunday morning to be reassured that the status quo is good and that God loves us the way we are. And meanwhile, the black church gathers to hear the hope that one day God will come and set this all right and that God loves them despite their troubles. Fundamentally different messages proclaimed on Sunday mornings. So let me tell you what I hope. I hope we can get justice for George Floyd and all the others. And I hope for an end to the violence. I don't condone it, but I understand it. It gives the police an excuse to attack, so I hope that it ends. You see, we can do a lot if we don't have to argue about why did you burn down that business? But these people have been oppressed for so long, they really no longer care. But I hope for a day when the president can do something other than show that he has more power than anyone else. I know he has the Army and the Air Force and the Navy and the Coast Guard and the Space Force all at his disposal, and the Marines. But do we need to hear every day as he threatens to send them against his protesters? I hope for a real conversation to begin about race everywhere in this land. We need calm and we need conversation. I hope for a conversation among the churches in town about this, including black and brown people's churches. I'm looking for those pastors, seeking them out. We need to learn to listen more and to hear what they have to say. <coughs> I hope for some changes in the way that our nation polices people. The idea that a black man is guilty until proven innocent is not helpful. Police work is hard. You get a call and someone says, our house was robbed. The robber's black and he was wearing a greenish jacket. What are you gonna do? You go stop everybody wearing a greenish jacket who's black and ask them if they did it. It's hard. But you don't berate them and scream at them as though they're guilty. And it happens every day. I hope for changes in the way that we put people in jail. Part of the problem we have in society is the high rate of black men who serve time in prison. You and I would get a fine, they get thrown in prison. It's not right, it's not fair, it needs to be looked at. And I hope for changes in the way that we look at people who are different from us. They're not the enemy, but sometimes we assume they are. <coughs> last, year, <I> went, <coughs> last year, 
Last year, I went to New York City for a conference. I had all kinds of adventures in the travel, and I finally ended up at a hotel in Queens at 2 o'clock in the morning. So the next morning, I got up and was told the train station was four blocks away, and I started walking, very aware that a white man pulling a suitcase was a kind of target in this neighborhood. All these people were my enemies. And as I walked along, I began to you know, look at these enemies, and I realized most of them are walking their children to school. They don't care about me. They're just trying to go to work. They were strangers, but they weren't enemies. We need to change the way that we see people. And I hope for changes in my own attitudes. You know, I, I learned about a month ago that the Confederate flag was not a symbol that honors our forefathers. I learned that when the rednecks in Wisconsin had it flying as they took to the steps of their state house with their weapons. My initial reaction was, why are they using our flag? I mean, they live in Wisconsin. Then I realized that it's, not, it's no longer about Southern heritage at all. I'd been ambivalent about that for years, but not anymore. I can remember the battles and respect those who fought on both sides without holding up any lost cause myths. It was a terrible war, the Civil War. It divided our country. Slavery was abolished, but the mistreatment of black people continues. And that's the real problem that we have. So I hope for a gospel, for the gospel to make a difference in our lives to the point where we can really have a society that can see race and color and all of its richness and respect and value it for the betterment of everyone. I hope for that and I pray for that, knowing that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can bring that about. And my hope is in some ways an eschatological hope. At the last day, this is how it will be. So I hope, with a more temporal hope, that at least partly in our lives it can begin to be that way. If we trust God and work for it. I have lots of hopes. We're long on questions today and short on answers. That's the way it goes. And now you're thinking this is a long way from Genesis 1. But think about it. The Trinity exists as love and in the scripture calls for justice all the time. And so we think about the Trinity, we have to think about love and justice. So while it seems like a long jump from Genesis to our racial issues, it's not really very far. Cornell West, my professor years ago, says that justice is love lived in public. I think he's right. So let us live with justice and love and let us honor God and one another every day. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Trinity of love and power, we come to you today asking for your presence with us. Be near to us and sustain us. Hear us as we pray. We give you thanks, triune God, for your saving work in Jesus Christ, your Son who lived and died and lives again for us and with us. We thank you for the presence of your spirit who brings us guidance and comfort at every turn. And we thank you, Father, for your gracious providential work in our world at every moment. And we pray for our world broken again at this time we pray for those who have been hurt by the actions of the police, government, society, by all who seem to have lied to them again. Be with them and sustain them in their pain. We pray for protesters, that they would see some fruit of their work. We pray for justice 
for fairness everywhere. We even pray for looters and those promoting violence, O oh God. Bring them to the Prince of Peace. Help them change their ways. We pray for those who lead us, that they would not incite further pain by their actions or lack of actions, but would instead lead us into a new era of real communication between the races. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your spirit would descend upon our world and change it, fix it, rearrange it, so that it is different and better than it is now, so that there is justice and peace between people, so that all your children can live in peace. Let it be so, Lord God. And we pray that you would heal the sick cure the diseases, comfort the grieving, be with those who are lonely and scared, and in all things, teach us to trust in your love and your power, for you alone are worthy, and we give you praise. We pray in Jesus' name, and we pray the prayer that he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So go in peace, and may all the blessing of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.